Warren Norton, and we have Hayward Clarkson, who is related to Nathaniel Hayward, and if it weren't for Nathaniel Hayward, Warren Norton, and Hayward would not be here today. <laughs> <laughs> so, honored guest, thank you, and Kitty, I love that you're here. Kitty canceled a department heads meeting for this lecture. <laughs> That's how much we've been looking forward to this. Kitty, do you have like to say a few words? I'd love to say a few words, and I do mean a few. And just, I had an eight o'clock meeting this morning out of the office, and I left the meeting a little early, and I, you know, I drove way too fast to get here. <laughs> However, this is something I would not miss. I know that we're in for a treat. So many special thanks to Penny and Grant and Becky and the back the Patton family. And I just learned from Cynthia Coker that it was Cynthia Coker who heard Lauren's talk earlier, I guess it was last spring, and you were talking about the whole Manigo family and all of that, and Cynthia says, well, I know the Pattons. So Cynthia introduced um, Lauren to the Pattons, and here we are today, and this to me is just such a highlight. So thank you for, we're all so lucky to be here today. Thank you so much, and especially for the Pattons. And another special thanks Cynthia Coker because it's Cynthia that worked so hard to help me plan the programming every year for this event. I have passed around just a little bit of housekeeping before I introduce Lauren, who needs no introduction whatsoever, to this group. Uh, Dinner with the Washingtons by Stephen McLeod is our last and final lecture. Following that lecture, we will go to Suzanne Pollock's for a lovely reception and she will prepare the dish for us from Stephen McClough's book and then we'll also have a little bit of Charleston share and some punch to go along with that. So I'm passing around a sign-up sheet. We do need to have a head count for that and this is one of those events where participants are invited to invite others. So please keep your spouses and your friends in mind, but we do have limited capacity at 45 because this room seats 45. So keep that in mind, sign up. Uh, the sheet is going around. Lauren Northup has been with us for almost <coughs> four years and she started as the house museum manager in the Russell House. She made it through the back of house renovations and now serves as the collections manager here. So we are partners in crime as we preserve and protect Charleston's material culture, but specifically the collection here at the Historic Charleston Foundation. And this research began when she was at St. Andrews. But even before this, the story was her bedtime story that her parents would tell because Lauren is a descendant of Louis and Charles Manico. This is the second part of a lecture that was started last year. So we are going to learn about Gibbs Street and the family history and the material culture surrounding the Manicos. So thank you so much, Lauren, and I know that this is uh, thank you. I know that you're filming today and you did some great flyovers. That was so lovely, and let's get started. All right, I keep pressing this so we can watch this 15 second on a loop over and over. I've watched it about a thousand times since we captured it on Monday. Um, but I did want to introduce really quickly Michael Damrich, who's just going to wave at everyone. Uh, he so kindly worked with me to capture this footage of the house by drone, which is kind of a terrifying new technology to a lot of people. I think it brings to mind ISIS and all sorts of nefarious things. But really, drones can be used so well in historic preservation as a way to look at structures in a way that we can't in any other possible way. So. Um, Michael met me on Monday when the weather was nice, though a little bit windy, and um, we just got some footage of the front of the house and then some aerials to really help orient everybody as we go into this lecture and um, think about where this house is situated 
on the peninsula. And I'll get it more into that as we go along. Um, but I just could watch this all day. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going there later, so. <coughs> So I know we've already welcomed the patents, um, but I can I would be remiss if I did not start with that because uh, they are our most special guests, um, Dr. and Mrs. Patton here in the front, and their daughter Becky Fenno as well in the back, who has been such a great resource for me as an architect and friend um, in this process. When I first delivered my lecture on Louis to this group uh, two years ago, I showed this photo of Six Gibbs and sort of just put out into the universe that it really was my life's dream to go inside this house. And I saw Cynthia's face when I said that. She kind of just went like this at me, like, well, that's the Patton's house. <laughs> life's dream. We will make that happen. And so, um, she made that come true, uh, made that connection, and last year I had one of the most seminal mornings of my life visiting the house and having luncheon on the second floor piazza with Mrs. Patton and her daughter Becky. And um, I thank you for allowing me to do that and also ignoring kindly when I did cry just a little bit <laughs> downstairs. <laughs> and so, I'll tell anyone who will listen that this is my favorite house in Charleston, and um, I'll rhapsodize about how it's kept in such a way that allows you to feel the spirit of this house. And you will see that when we go there today. I don't have to just convince you with words. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for welcoming me and allowing us to visit today. And um, I hope that I can provide a little context before we go over so that you all can feel, as I do, the weight of history that lives inside this house because there's nothing else like it. So, this is the house in about 1870. We have Louis Manigo sitting in the foreground with his daughter Josephine on his knee. His son Louis, in a Confederate <coughs> uniform, is playing with a hoop and stick. And then we've got his two sisters in the background, they retained two servants for some years after the war, um, but not for very long. And then these are his two younger children as well. Um, this picture hung on the wall in my dad's office my whole life, and it was always sort of, oh, this is the ancestral home, and, um, but we don't have it anymore because <laughs> we lost everything. And so that really is the light motif of the Manigos for me for years and years. Um, and the Pattons were so kind to share this photo with me when I visited last week. Uh, something to keep in mind about the house, in the years that the Manigos lived in the house, 1837 to 1899, and um, for time immemorial before that, the Ashley River ran right alongside this house. And I mean right alongside it. <laughs> this is the house here. This arrow is misleading, I think. <laughs> but um, I was so thrilled to see this image because it provided context for this image, which my dad has had in a drawer for years, and I love to poke fun at my dad. And we're filming this so he can see it later. Uh, so I'm going to really poke fun at him because there's nothing he can say. But he loves to pull images and pictures and objects just out of closets and drawers. And he torments me with it because he knows that it drives me crazy. And he says, oh, yeah, I found this picture the other day. And it'll be something like this, which is Gabriel Manigo, who was Louis' brother um, and the first curator of the Charleston Museum sitting in the garden at Six Gibbs, and then right behind him here, that's the river. So that's the river vista from the garden at Six Gibbs. So if I can figure out how to go back. This is some of the drone footage that we captured on Monday. So I hope this gives you an idea of what it's like now. So again, here's this image from the late 19th century, and then here's today. So this house is what's in the foreground of the other image, and then here's six gibbs, and then this is where the river was. Okay, 
So that's Linwood. And that's Linwood now. It's another view of the garden uh, from 1870. And again, this is the river here. And then these, burn these into your brain because you'll see one of these again in the garden today. So the house was built circa 1806 by Isaac Parker. Um, he was a planter in St. Thomas and St. Denis Parish and a brickyard owner. It was remodeled in the Regency style by Colonel William Drayton with money won in the East Bay Lottery in 1820. So it was magnificently redone then. He was an officer in the War of 1812 and a staunch unionist from the very beginning. Um, after the nullification controversy, which would anyone like to weigh in on their knowledge of the nullification crisis? Uh, he decided that he'd had enough of the South and he wanted to remain in the North and so he went back to Philadelphia and he sold the house to Nathaniel Hayward. So Nathaniel Hayward uh, at this time was a massive landowner in uh, the Low Country and he had six children, almost $900,000 worth of holdings, which at that time was about $4 million just in land. He was um, a good friend to the Mangos. They had intermarried many times. You'll see later when we look at the family tree that there's a lot of similar cousins all together. Um, his youngest daughter, Elizabeth, um, married Charles Izzard Mandigo uh, in the 1820s. And Daniel Hayward, seeing that Charles was a young man of an artistic disposition, uh, and also somewhat of a gypsy, he <laughs> decided that he would gift this house to them so they could live there and raise their children. So Charles and Elizabeth raised their six children in this house starting in 1837. And um, that brings us to Louis, who was their second son. So this is the earliest family portrait we have of Charles. Uh, this is, of course, the the Gibbs portrait that was recently exhibited in, in Palm Beach. We have Charles and Elizabeth, and then their two sons, Gabriel and Louis. Gabriel is riding on the dog. Uh, this was done while they were on Grand Tour in 1831. And I should mention, if you attended the Building Bridges and Breaking Ground Symposium and have heard Kathy Staples talk about Zarafa mania and how um, women of this time were becoming rather obsessed with styling their hair like a giraffe, <laughs> then Elizabeth's hairstyle will make sense to you. <laughs> and I have to say that it has not made sense to me for many years mm -hmm. until Kathy's lecture. And then I was sitting looking at this image and I went, that's why her hair looks like that. <laughs> so um, Kathy will have to update us to Zarafa Mania later. So here's Louie. Louis was born in 1828 in Paris. Um, studying his life is honestly a near religious obsession of mine. He is a fascinating man, uh, extremely eloquent, and it doesn't hurt that he has terrific and very neat handwriting so that reading the thousands of pages that he wrote in his lifetime is a breeze. Um, he died in November of 1899, so just a month shy of the 20th century, which is absolutely <coughs> astonishing to me. So his lifespan, if you think about it, born in 1828 on Grand Tour with his family in Paris, comes of age, marries, has two children, and then the outbreak of the Civil War, and then lives until 1899. Now, all of this happened more or less at Six Gibbs Street. And everything that he wrote about that time and everything he experienced, the common thread is that house. So keep that in mind as we go through. I would just like to add that <laughs> since I gave my last lecture, um, we welcomed a baby girl into our family. <laughs> and um, her name is Louisa Manigo, Adam Louie. So that's my shameless baby photo. <laughs> so here is um, Louie's family tree. This is just four generations, but again, We've got Peter Manigo and Peter Manigo here. 
but this kind of helps keep everybody in order. And um, the only generations missing from this as we go back are Gabriel the Merchant and then the original Huguenot Pierre. So that's the line of Manigos down to Louis. And this family tree was absolutely implanted in his brain from birth. And he worshiped his ancestors like nobody I've ever mm -hmm. read in any archive anywhere. Um, so I can distribute this at the end as well if you'd like to kind of figure out where it lies. But if you look at the names on here, so you've got Nathaniel Hayward, and we'll talk about these as we go through, but Nathaniel Hayward, Gabriel Manigo, the architect, Peter Manigo, speaker of the house, Rafe Izzard, I mean, these are all the great sort of men of the early colonies and then the early city kind of funneling down to Louis. And I think he really felt the weight of that responsibility a tremendous amount as well. And so I think less so focusing on um, how great it was and more so how burdened he was by it is, is, a, is an interesting way to look at the choices that he made in his life. So here is Ray Izzard. Um, this is, of course, the portrait that's at the Boston MFA it's done by Copley um, while they were on Grand Tour. And interestingly, I did some new research for this talk, which I swore I would not go down into the rabbit hole, but I always thought that this portrait was sold after Louis died because I thought that it would just kill him to sell this portrait. Um, and it wasn't. There's an entire pile of correspondence at the Charleston Museum talking about shopping this portrait around as early as 1872. The Corcoran, he has Governor William Aiken go to the Corcoran and ask the curator if they would like to acquire this portrait in 1876. And there's a letter back from the curator of the Corcoran saying, we have asked our collections committee and unfortunately we are not acquiring objects just now, which I thought was funny because that's exactly what we do today. <laughs> but unfortunately, they really passed up a good one, I think. Um, so, very interesting. And that warrants much further study, and I'm really excited about it. Uh, but here are some of the portraits that would have been hanging, and we're going to talk about this at length, in um, the drawing rooms at Six Gibbs. So Louis was a very visual person, very devoted to his ancestors, and he kept this visual ancestral family tree around him at all times and at all costs. And he went to great lengths during the war to preserve these portraits. But these are just some of them. So we've got Ramsey's portrait of Peter Manigo, which then went missing in the 20th century. And if you have it in your closet, please let us know. <laughs> um, the Theus, we, there's another pair of Theuses of the earlier Gabriel. We've got Gilbert Stewart's portraits of Mr. and Mrs. Gabriel Manigo. And we also have line drawings done <laughs> by people like George Rupel, um, and this is sort of the cheekier side of the Manigas, but um, they, you know, they were very, they were very French people. They were very uh, brash, opulent, wealthy, learned, traveled, um, and then it all sort of came to a galloping end, and um, we'll, we'll talk about that today. And I don't know if you've ever read the little things that these guys are saying, but it's, it's worth a look if you haven't. It's very, very body, and I don't know if they're saying some of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, which brings us to Charles. Charles is Louis' father. Um, this is his portrait done by Sully that I think Louis probably prized above all others. Uh, it was, it, it now is in the collection of the Gibbs. But this was done in 1817 before Charles departed for his trip around the world, which then we talked about last time. Um, Louis emulated in 1851. But he's leaning against the mast. He's young. It's 1817. He has all the money in the world. His father died when he was 14. He's now 19. He's ready to go. He really, he writes about how he took a draft on, he basically extracted all the money he could from his father's estate and just lit out for the East. Lost it all, <laughs> and then some, and then um, had to work for six years doing some kind of nefarious things. Piracy, smuggling, <laughs> which he does not parse in his 
newspapers um, to earn, the, earn his passage back home. So Louis was, despite being the second son, he was Charles' real heir apparent. Um, Charles always said, this is Louis, qui ira en Chine, this is Louis who will go to China. And I should also mention that the man who has always spoke French at home, um, and Louis writes, I'd say at least half of his papers in French. And um, I found a new inventory yesterday, but it's in French. And so I haven't had time to transcribe it yet, so I'm sorry I can't present that to you. So who can remember any detail about Louis' trip around the world? This is my quiz for you. Um, this is his portrait that was done in Canton on ivory. I think the most important thing about Louis' trip around the world is can anybody what, remember what happened to him when he goes to the White Cloud Mountains and Hi meets man. with, sorry? Highwaymen? And meets with some bandits, yeah. Do you guys remember that story from the lecture? So um, in 1851, Louis goes to the White Cloud Mountains with a friend of his from Canton and some coolies come out of the mountains and stop them with swords and have a good old fashioned sword <coughs> fight. This is in 1851 with a nice little Charleston boy, but he has his umbrella and he has been taught fencing as a young man and he says that he's able to beat them off with his umbrella. And um, by that way, he says he escaped being outright killed. Um, but it was during this mugging, essentially, that he received a sword Flash on his head that was so violent that um, it took him three months to recover before he could even come home. And he doesn't write, he's very stoic, and he doesn't write a lot about uh, the effects of that until we get to the Civil War when he says, I am unable to serve in the Confederate Army because of this sword slash on my head. It has rendered me incapable of service. And so in a way, the fact that he was able to survive the war is really, I think, thanks to being hit in the head in China. So he comes home from his grand tour, which last time I spoke for two hours on that, so we're just going to gloss right over it. Um, but he comes home, and he is desirous of having a wife. And he hears, he, I, I guess there was no one in Charleston that he found suitable, but he hears of a woman in Savannah who's called the Belle of Savannah. And they keep sort of narrowly missing each other. He goes to Savannah, and then she goes up to Vernonburg, and then he goes up to Philadelphia, and she's there but having dinner at someone else's house. And he, and he writes, of course, again, an exhaustive detail about all the near misses that he's had with Francis Matilda Elizabeth Haversham. Um, <coughs> And this is in 1857. He finally, in um, March, was invited to dine at her uncle's house, uh, William Nail Haversham, and they met. And this is in March, and he says, upon my first interview, I was greatly possessed in every manner with Miss Haversham, which finally terminated on 1st of December in her becoming my wife. So Louis is typically very verbose, but in the subject of Fanny, as she's called, um, he is not whatsoever going to say anything. In fact, he destroyed all of their correspondence in 1878, which is really unlike him. Um, and so very little survives about their relationship or what they said between each other, which is sad. Um, but this portrait remains. This is actually in the family. This was done while they were on their honeymoon in Paris. and. Um, so keep this in mind, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, <laughs> the marriage. Um, in a letter to Louis on his wedding day, Charles Izzard Manigo, his father, explains to him why he did not attend the wedding. Um, all the rest of the Manigo family attended, and Charles wrote to say, this is your marriage day, and I wish you all future happiness, and don't see any reason why you should not have your full share of it. I wrote what I considered was a very satisfactory excuse for not being able to attend on the occasion, um, as much would have gone wrong here if I had absented myself. I have now at work, and this is at 6 Gibbs Street, 
I have now at work seven carpenters, six painters, six lathers, six plasterers, and two men putting up a chimney and marble mantle, besides Stepney working at the new stable and Ben mixing mortar, and Jake hauling two loads of sand per day from the farm, etc., etc. So, um, while Louis is being married in Savannah, his dad is fixing the house. <laughs> I think any owners of historic homes can appreciate that. So after the wedding, Fanny and Louis spent their first winter at Gowrie. Gowrie was Louis' um, plantation home on Argyle Island, which is just north of Savannah. And no record remains of how she felt about living at Gowrie. Gowrie was, by all intents and purposes, a very small <laughs> camp house, um, wooden siding. And Louis, of course, loved it because he was very romantic. But I really wish that her impressions of living in that sort of swampy, um, remote place survive if they don't. Uh, but very quickly thereafter, they arrived back in Charleston. They were only at Gowrie for about six months. And they came uh, back for the winter season in Charleston. So they spent a week at Six Gibbs enjoying the races and the balls. And um, Louis was so proud of his new bride. Um, he says she was in height, build, and stature decidedly English, whilst in looks somewhat Spanish. Five feet seven and three eighths inches in height, commanding in person, large dark brown eyes with dark, nearly black hair and heavy black eyebrows and a remarkably regular profile. So, <laughs> in May of 1858, so as soon as the winter season was over, um, Louis writes, my father with his accustomed liberality and kindness gave me a credit on a banker in Paris for 10,000 in gold and advised my taking Mrs. Manigo to Europe. This was Fanny's first trip abroad in her life. Although it had already been my lot to have visited Europe over four previous occasions, besides have, having circumnavigated the globe and visited Asia, Africa, and South America with ample funds in my possession, the present voyage far outstripped them all in pleasure, happiness, and every species of enjoyment. With my young and handsome bride, this was the brightest moment in both of our lives and shall ever be regarded thus. So, very sweet and um, interesting to think about in light of what we talked about last time with his trip around the world, where um, he, you know, that was the moment of his life then. But no, no, everything is much better with a beautiful Spanish-looking bride with a regular profile by his side. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, he doesn't give a very detailed account of their trip in his memoir, but he does say um, they visited New York, they went through England, Dublin, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Mrs. Manigo was perfectly charmed with all she saw, so much so that upon many occasions in after years did she recall to mind Edinburgh, regretting greatly it did not happen to be her home. And when I read that a couple years ago, studying for my master's, living in Edinburgh, I felt very validated. <laughs> so leaving Scotland, we entered England, visiting Newcastle and passing some days at York. The imposing church service in the venerable Yorkminster impressed us greatly. Our stay in London was ample for sightseeing. While here, we furnished ourselves each with a handsome gold watch from one of the first jewelers in England, Hunt and Rockwell 156, New Bond Street, London. By way of Folkestone, we crossed the British Channel to Boulogne in France, finally settling down in Paris, occupying a suite of handsomely furnished apartments, immediately facing the palace and gardens of the Tuileries. Our life here in this gay capital was happiness in the extreme, Sightseeing occupied most of our time by day, while at night, the opera, theater, and other places of amusement engaged our time. It happened also that during the summer, 1858, a large number of our Paris friends were Charlestonians. And this is another place where I wish he would go into more detail, because I would love to know who was there. But um, on the fifth day of September, Mrs. Manigo welcomed their first child, Louis. And um, Louis's joy of a namesake son born in Paris just as Louis had been born in Paris, was unparalleled. And to mark the occasion, two months later in November, she had this portrait painted by um, Charlemagne Oscar Louis, who was a French artist. And Louis says, we spared no expense and befriended who we consider to be the best painter in Paris <coughs> at the time to do this portrait. And there's a companion portrait <coughs> of him and it's interesting because she's painted to be in Paris, but in his portrait, he's painted as if he's in Canton. So, 
I'm always confused a little bit by that. But um, by December of 1858, so this is painted in November. By December, uh, Louis was back at Gowery. So as far abroad as he went, and as much fun as he had, unlike his father, he still was a very business-oriented man. He was very serious about rice cultivation. And um, he had left Gowrie in charge of an overseer when he left a man named Brian, who had just destroyed the place in his absence. The um, harvest was bad. The overseer hadn't even been at the plantation for almost a year. And um, he, he just says, there was evidence of neglect, which is a lot for him to say. Um, and so he undertook to plant the crop himself and act as overseer in that winter and then spring. And then in April of the next year, he actually hires, um, and I found this interesting, a man named William Capers at the rate of $1,000 per annum, which was the most he'd ever paid anyone uh, to work on the plantation. Uh, he was formerly the overseer for Governor William Aiken at Jahasi. So he brought Capers in because Capers was known to be this fabulous, industrious man who could set everything right. And um, so this is in 1859. So remember in your timeline of the Civil War, 1859, it's coming. <laughs> and um, Capers, Capers dove in and started to tr try to reform various things, uh, but various freshets, as they're called, storms, um, things happened. And Louis was just never able to get a good rice crop at Gowrie, despite absolutely devoting his life to it for those years. Um, they returned to Charleston in May 1860, where Fanny uh, gave birth to Joseph Habersham Manigo, um, and Joseph did not survive infancy. And Louis lost two children in infancy, and he writes extensively about um, the, his emotions surrounding that, whereas he won't really discuss his wife very much in detail. He was just absolutely destroyed by the two deaths of his children. And um, it, at the end of his life, almost nothing else occupied his mind except for that, which I think is telling. So the Civil War began that spring with the bombardment of Fort Sumter on April 12, 1861. Um, this is a daguerreotype of Louis in his Confederate uniform. And like I said, he sustained the injury in China and didn't serve uh, at the beginning of the war. His two brothers, Gabriel and Alfred, signed up immediately. Is um, that the scar? Well, I was going to say, so this, I have the original to here over here that you can look at afterwards, but in every other picture, portrait, anything of Louis, after he returns from China, he's always turned to the side, except for this one. And in this one, you really can see the scar of the saber, and he says it it really plagued him the rest of his life, and you know, I can imagine that. But if you look at this daguerreotype of his face and his eyes, I'm gonna keep this up while we talk about what happens to him during the war, because obviously there's really no other images of the war, really, <coughs> um, and just, just ruminate on that. But yes, that is his scar. Uh, Gabriel and Alfred joined the army, as I said. He um, bound together with his father, Charles, was left in the care of six gifts, their plantations, their farm home, and also this, all the women of the family. So there were many unmarried aunts, sisters, daughters, and, and the wives. So all of them together got together with Charles and Louis and they really saw themselves as the keepers of the women. And so that was what they did for the first two years of the war, um, moving people back and forth. So Louis kept a journal called the, the War Journal in between sort of 1861 and 1867, where he records everything that happens to him, and it's a staggering account of what was going on in the Sea Islands. So, his journal from May 1861 to May 1862 gives a glimpse of the war as um, battles were rage, raging all around him. He says, the unrighteous and diabolical war now raging between our Confederate states and the United States is causing great distress among the seacoast plantations of South Carolina and Georgia. 
A brief synopsis of the history of our Savannah River property for the past year will be interesting hereafter as showing how even in our secluded position, we were not entirely exempt from the suffering of the times. In May 1861, <coughs> I left Savannah River after having spent the entire winter with my family on Gowrie Plantation. During the summer, the regular plantation work continued without interruption whilst we spent it quietly, our first, in our charming residence at number six Gibbs Street, Charleston. All was quiet around our two cities, Charleston and Savannah, until the attack and fall of Port Royal in early <coughs> November. Then at once was a change discerned among the Negroes, but especially amongst those in the vicinity of Beaufort. Some were captured by the Yankees, and as we were informed, compelled to work for them, erecting batteries on Hilton Head Island and other places, whilst with the masters and overseers driven from the numerous plantations in that neighborhood, great numbers of Negroes were running away, seeking to avoid work of every kind besides stealing all that they could lay their hands upon. But then he says, in Savannah, quite a panic had taken place. Numerous families were hastening to take shelter in the interior of Georgia. The same feeling existed in Charleston. Indeed, says Louis, had the enemy known the weakness of our two cities and the great consternation spreading throughout the entire community in November 1861, they would surely have caused us far more injury than they did. He adds, strange to say, six months have elapsed since then, during which period we have very much fortified ourselves. So by that he means that he deemed it unsafe for anybody to be at the plantations and in fact rented a house in Macon, Georgia, for his family and sent everybody to Macon and then returned to the gallery by himself to stay there. Um, he talks about slowly, it's, it's amazing how the tone changes. Slowly, you know, he's saying, oh, the harvest was bad, this happened, but then he starts to say, people are starting to sicken and die on the plantation because all we have to eat is rice and fish, which Previously, we were able to catch with nets and fish hooks. We can't have any fish hooks. We can't get any yarn. We can't make any nets. We can't even have a fish line. So the fish are in the river, but we can't catch them because we've melted down all of our fish hooks, melted down all of our weights, everything for, and he says, to make bullets for our pistols. And so it starts, that's the first intimation that things are starting to get bleak. And, um, he says, I'm thinking what it will be year after year as the struggle progresses, for I must confess there is not the least indication of the forthcoming peace as yet, and the hatred between the two contending parties seems to be more and more profound. The Confederate states have waged this war with the determination to bear against all and every privation. Cut off from all intercourse with foreign nations, it is most remarkable how we are developing our own resources and battling thus far, as well as can be expected, with the most powerful enemy. So you can see that in 1862, he already sees that the enemy is extremely powerful and he's not really sure what's gonna happen. So in 1863, that's sort of a watershed time, I think, in the war, but also for Louis. Um, his brother Gabriel, who would go on to be the curator of the Charleston Museum, gives a musket ball shot through his two eyebrows and it just nicks in and then right out and he is totally fine um, but that close call I think is what finally realized made Louis realize that he wanted to be a part of the service and so he goes um, and reports to the headquarters and says you know look I got cut in the head with a sword but I will do whatever you need and so they appoint him secretary to the uh, to this surgeon named Joseph Jones, who is the surgeon of the Confederate Army, who is engaged in a scientific study of infectious disease in camps. And um, Louis, of course, it has a very active mind and is interested in all manner of scientific discovery, and so really enjoys this post talks about it at length as being just the best thing that happened to him and he loves to go around and see all these places filled with pestilence and it's and his his records of course like always are meticulous handwritten and um, you can see them in the Library of Congress and it's charming because you know he's very devoted but then sometimes in the margins he'll sort of doodle his own hand 
or he'll write Manigo in Chinese, or there's just these tiny little glimpses of him um, in these otherwise very official documents. So he talks a lot about visiting Charleston and visiting Charleston during the bombardment, which is a very harrowing time. He says um, he rides the train in, and uh, that, of course, was beset with hardship. So he says, since the commencement of the war, the wear and tear upon our various railroads, occasioned by their continual use for government purposes and the impossibility of repairing them in our present blockaded condition, has caused traveling at the present time by this method to be slow and even attended with danger, accidents occurring constantly. Amongst the thousands of inconveniences and privations to which our struggle has brought us, the great scarcity of oil and lights of every kind may be classed as most serious. So he's in the dark a lot and he does not like it. The old South Carolina Railroad at present is in a most wretched condition and as the company cannot afford to light up any other but what is termed the ladies car, I had to travel the greater part of the night in the dark, the rain pouring in, and a heavy easterly storm rendering it cold and uncomfortable. Fortunately, we had not to change cars at Branchville, so that undisturbed, we retained our seats throughout the little journey. Toward, toward early dawn, I began to distinguish faintly the outlines of spots known to me in my youth. So if you can imagine, he's coming down the neck of the peninsula. He says, such as Six Mile House, and in a few moments more, the quite familiar Four Mile Tavern. A quarter of an hour after that, still with our cold, cheerless, and pelting rain, we reached the terminus of the road, the station in Charleston. I was now about visiting the home of my ancestors when living, and there rests at present their sacred remains in an unbroken link from Pierre Manigo the Huguenot down to Gabriel Manigo, my respected grandfather. My own deeply attached Charleston was I approaching under peculiar and trying emotions. Of late, the Yankee shells from their Morris Island batteries had been scattered quite freely throughout the lower portion of the city. And although <coughs> up to this time, the only victim whose death had been caused by the missiles was a poor Negro woman already in advanced years, who, whilst pumping water in a yard as high up as Market Street, was killed on the spot by a fragment of shell striking her on the head. Still, there was no telling upon whom the deadly stroke might next fall. As a general thing, the lower <coughs> wards of Charleston were almost deserted by the few citizens clinging to their old family homes, they changing their abodes for the upper sections of the city as yet considered beyond the reach of Yankee guns. At last, on the 21st day of November, my father deemed it no longer prudent to occupy number six Good Street, he with Emma having bravely remained there up to that time. So if you can imagine, that's the only mention of six Gibbs during the bombardment, except for a letter written by Charles. Charles, at this point, um, is in his <coughs> late 40s, no, 50s, and he has his very young teenage daughter with him. So can you imagine riding out the bombardment in your house with your teenage daughter and just not knowing when the next shell will hit? So Charles writes to Louis in that same month, Mon cher Louis, we are in the midst of a sharp shelling just now. Colonel UG's house on Legree Street has just been injured by a shell, and three have fallen in Mr. Lassane's lot next to us. It now seems to have subsided for the last 20 minutes or so. For 20 minutes, <laughs> it subsided. And I'm just amazed at how long they stayed. And I, Louis writes elsewhere that they really were some of the last people to leave um, that area of the city during the bombardment. And, and where was Louis at the time? When he was writing, he was at Gowry. Yeah, Louis um, sent his family to Macon. He stayed at Gowry. And then um, as the forces came towards Savannah, they moved again, and they ended up going to Augusta. His family did. Um, but it was just this constant chessboard, just people moving constantly, and then also moving belongings ceaselessly. Um, Louis writes in 1863, my father gave me quite an interesting account of a dinner given to President Jefferson Davis by Governor William Aiken, at which he was invited. And of course, I'm keenly interested in this because of our own Aiken Red House. But he says, the president was dressed quite plainly and like a true patriot in a full suit of Confederate-made jeans. 
Upon an introduction to him, the president took pains to say a word to each one. To my father, he remarked, I presume, presume sir, you are related to General Manigo? An affirmative was the reply. He is a cousin of mine. Our president has been making a tour of inspection around the country and was passing through Charleston about three weeks ago on his return to Richmond. During the president's stay at Governor Aiken's house, my brother Alfred was sent by his captain with the corporal's guard to be posted at the house. The president, however, being informed of their presence, sent word through one of his aides that he thanked the dragoons but did not require their services. So I just love to imagine Alfred Manigo being sent over to the Aiken Red House to guard Jefferson the President Davis. It's just amazing to think about. So we move on. 1863, just the year, it just, it was the moment where I think Louis realized that the war was lost. And he writes about that um, after he visits the city. Uh, it's almost like he can't stay away from the city. He keeps just getting passage in despite needing a pass and not really needing to be there at all. Um, just so he can look around and see what's going on and then write about it extensively. So he says, with Captain, I proposed spending the morning in Charleston. Taking the Meeting Street Road, I drove down to Line Street and then turned into King Street. It is quite a novel aspect to witness the life in this heretofore quiet section of Charleston. All the public offices have been removed from the lower to the upper wards of the city. Here I found my friend Charles W. Henry, as usual, very much pleased to see me. I called at the office of the provost marshal, who immediately endorsed my passport. And he goes on, I visited the orphan house for the purpose of obtaining, if possible, the beautiful view of Charleston and its environs, embracing the harbor, James Island, and the Yankee fleet, and Fort Sumter all of which is seen panorama like from the cupola of this building. I did not succeed in obtaining a perfect view as was my desire, the last door to the cupola being locked and no one to inform me from whom I could obtain the key. So the orphans have been removed two months since to some safe and quiet retreat remote from the seaboard and the present appearance of things in the interior of the building is more that of confusion than otherwise. At the present moment, 10.30 a.m., the Yankees are not firing upon the city solemn stillness prevails, and I am strolling leisurely in the orphan house garden, watching the innocent and happy sparrows chirping and flying from tree to tree. I paused a while near the mutilated statue of William Pitt, Earl Chatham, and thought what a singular coincidence would it be should the enemy's shot strike it in the present war, as was the case during our revolution, when a shot from an English battery on James Island placed it in its present shattered condition, it standing in those days at the intersection of Meaning and Broad Streets. Charleston had, to me, a sad and forlorn aspect. I could not but feel strangely all the time I was there, imagining each moment a shell might burst over my head or frighten my horse in the buggy, causing him to run away. The lower portion of the city especially had a most abandoned appearance. It was quite sa I was quite satisfied when the time came for me to shape my course once more for the farm, which I reached about 1 p.m., meeting Alfred there, who had come from his camp and who was to remain with us until dark. He says, this day may be noted as a fete day for us, as we did what a family very seldom can, can in these times. It so pleased God that my father, mother, and their five children should all unite once more as in former days at the same dinner table. Such an event had not taken place for upwards of two years, during which Gabriel had experienced a most miraculous escape with his life. And that's where the shot went through his eyebrows. My fond father seemed quite touched at seeing all of his children together. It struck me he felt it deeply, and after the soup, he gave the following sentiment, may it please God that we be all united thus again and again. And sadly, that was the last time that the family would ever be all together, um, because shortly after that, Alfred died in service in Winsboro. And um, he didn't die of wounds sustained in battle. He was ill. And um, if you've read Graham Long's book, Stolen Charleston, he talks a lot about Alfred and what happens to Alfred in his sickness and death in Winsboro. It's a very sad story, um, I'm going to, but it, it, um, affected, it affected Louis very deeply. He felt very attached to Alfred, even though Alfred was, I think, 12 years his junior. He said that there was no other 
brother that he can converse with so freely on it, on so many different topics. So in 1863, he has uh, an, a letter from Charles. Charles is back at Six Gibbs. He decided it was unsafe, but then he couldn't stand it, so he went back. And he says, um, December 1863, our house in Gibbs Street was struck by a shell. It penetrated the piazza just under the banisters, three feet from the southwest corner post, then entered the smoking room, broke two of the bullfight pictures, and went straight through the brick wall between the corner and the window next to my writing desk, kicking up a great dust and knocking things about, but doing no other injury. The shell plunged into the little western garden and buried itself deeply in a large hole without bursting. And I got here and I thought, Oh no, I need to tell the patents. <laughs> but he says, don't dig there. He says, as the soil is light, it has gone down to the sand foundation six or eight feet below the surface with a big puddle of water over it. When we get back home again, I will fish it out and place it among the curiosities. And I will tell you that I found an inventory of their curiosity cabinet, and indeed there was a shell in it. So you're safe. <laughs> The city is so deserted that thieves are going about night and day, cutting and carrying off the copper pumps and lead pipes of all the cisterns, which they affected last week with our house cistern and the stable pump, but the kitchen cistern and pipes to the reservoir and the dwelling they were not aware of. So really, shells are one enemy, but it's the thievery that's going on that are robbing people of their basic water at this point. So it's getting bleak, in other words. Um, and at this point, in early 1864, Louis is sent to Andersonville Prison in Georgia with um, Surgeon Jones. And this is really the point at which um, he, I think, is done with the Civil War. He's sent um, with the surgeon to inspect what's happening at Andersonville. And everyone, I think, has a working knowledge of what happened at Andersonville. Of course, Wirtz, who was then executed for his mismanagement of it. Something like 3,000 Union um, prisoners died there. And Louis said that while he was there, over 100 people were dying every day. And I've toyed with including this in here, but he <coughs> writes this letter to his wife from Andersonville um, describing everything that he sees. And it's pages and pages and pages. And it's one of the most harrowing things I've ever read. And um, I will say that I would love to share it with anybody who's interested because I have it transcribed in a new PDF. So if you'd like to read that, just contact me and I'll send it to you. But it um, is, it really is, is the end for Louis. He's finished with war after seeing that sort of suffering. Um, so at this point, we're getting right towards the end of the war. Gabriel is in prison in the north. Alfred has died in Winsboro. Um, Louis writes, although I have written my father six letters, neither one word of or from him has reached me since the evacuation of Charleston. I presume you have heard of Joseph Manigo being robbed of $8,000 in Confederate money and his Manigo crest ring from his finger. I commence now to find it a most difficult matter to support my family on account of the high prices of all articles. Should things continue thus, God only knows to what extreme we shall be driven to avoid star starvation. So he writes, Fanny and Louie are quite well, and my daughter Josephine is a great pet of mine. At this point, they just can't get word to each other, so they don't know what's happening in each city. Um, but Charles is still at, at six gifts, and he writes, uh, My dear son, I received yours of the 16th of March this morning. This is in April of 1865. It being the first letter from either of our sons or the least information respecting them for upwards of two months. Can you imagine not hearing from your children for two months during the war? On our finding that the city was actually evacuating, we hurried to our house in town on 17th of February, and the northern troops took possession the next day. We therefore, in occupying our house, prevented its being taken possession of by the troops or gangs of Negroes who flocked to the city in great numbers to enjoy their freedom. Every individual of our Negro servants has left us, but your two sisters and Victoire, who was their French nurse who lived with them for about 30 years, do everything and do it extremely well and cheerfully, and we are really getting on comfortably, all things considered. 
So he's living in Six Gibbs during the Union possession of Charleston. And he went there so that nobody could take over his house. So it's just him and his teenage daughter, his French servant, and his young, young grandson. He says, we have engaged a white woman to cook and wash and milk the cow, etc., who will come shortly, and a small boy in our neighborhood and myself attend the carriage horses. So at that point, um, the war is almost over. The, the troops have won, Charleston is occupied, and um, finally, at the end of the war, Louis is beaten. He's just completely beaten. He has no qualms about taking the oath and ending it. And he takes the oath of allegiance on 7th of October in Charleston, and he writes simply in his diary, I took the oath of allegiance today. And then under that, he, wrote, he writes, Future generations will never be fully conversant with the trials we Confederates were made to feel with the failure of the cause. Piece by piece, I parted with my entire furniture, carpets, silver, and odds and ends to save my family from starvation. This was a trying period in my life. In the midst of my suffering, my noble wife sustained me, remarking that for her, quote, she cared not if cast upon some barren isle, remote from all civilization, as long as we two were only together. These are moments when the true character of some women shine forth in all its splendor, and man feels blessed in having such a support. Marriage without affection had best never take place at all. And so that's really what I take away from reading everything Louis writes about the war, is at the end of it, he just realizes that all he's got left is his family. And from 1865 until his death in 1899, that is his sole focus, his sole purpose, and it is what he absolutely devotes himself to. So at the end of the war, they finally lose all of their land holdings. They lose marshland, which is what they call the farm, which is up by Six Mile House. They lose, they try to rent gallery for a while and use it as a way to make money, but at this point, rice is ending, rice cultivation is becoming too expensive, and, he, and hiring the labor to do it just doesn't work. And he tries that until 1870, but then he realizes he just can't. So they piece by piece sell off all their land, and the only thing that they have left is this house. And so he has this photo made uh, in 1870, and at this point I have to say that his wife died. So Fanny died in 1868, which is what we will talk about when we go over to the house. But in 1870, he has this photo made, and here he is with their daughter Josephine, and then his son Louis, and as I said, everybody in the background. And it's really interesting when you look at this photo, all the windows are open, and the paint, and you can't really see it on the slide, but the paint is just peeling off the house. And that's where we get into that concept of two port of paint, two pouch whitewash, and that was very true of this family. Uh, they held on to this house absolutely as long as they could. And um, the post-war period is a happy period, I think, for him, despite everything. And, um, and I have three events that took place post-war in the house. Um, Fanny's death, which was extremely sad for him, but then his daughter Josephine's wedding, and then the earthquake of 1886. So everything that we just went through, now we have these three events happening. And um, it's really just such a continuum of life and family and it all the common thread is this house. But to me, what makes this house most special are um, the stories, so I'll end with my favorite story, which comes from this photograph, uh, which only recently was found in our files. This was taken in 1878, and it has um, Louis's two sisters, Emma and Harriet, who lived at the house and never married, and raised his children after Fanny died. And then if you look, there's a tiny little figure up here, and that's because um, that's Louis's daughter, Josephine. So when they were gonna take the photo, she came out onto the piazza with his aunts. And the story goes 
that they said, you cannot be in this photograph. You need to go back inside. And so she went back inside and then showed them a thing or two. They came out on the third floor piazza. And that is the family story of, of this photo that's been handed down for generations. But um, I thank you for uh, listening to Louis, a bit of Louis' story. It's an embarrassment of riches. It's almost impossible to choose what aspects to highlight. But um, really, I can't wait for going over to the house. So thank you so much.